Well, good morning. We're glad that you have joined us for our morning worship service. We trust that our time in Sunday school was something that fed you and fed your family. We hope that you uh, participated in that. We also hope that you have uh, gone to our website, downloaded those uh, handouts for today, including your song lyrics, so that you can join in singing with us as we sing this morning, Come Christians, Join to Sing. We invite you to sing right from where you are, whether that's in your living room, your home, wherever that might be this morning. We hope you will join in worshiping the risen Lord with us. Come, Christians, join to sing.
Well, good morning. It's good to be together on this uh, Easter resurrection morning. Uh, the best we can be right now is online. We sure miss everyone. And uh, we are just praying fervently for the leadership of our country and all of the leadership that uh, soon uh, we, they could get liberty to let us go back, back to life uh, in, as we know it. And a big part of that is the assembly being together as brothers and sisters in Christ. I know you're up and you're, there you are and uh, watching this in your brand new Easter pajamas. I mean, you, the finest Easter pajamas you could get. You look just marvelous today, but uh, it is good. It's, it's always good to rejoice, and especially in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about it. Because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our sins are paid in full. You know, on the cross, Jesus said, it's finished. And amen for that. The atonement was made, but it would have been all for naught if not on the third day. On the third day, the exclamation mark, beyond all doubt, as Jesus rose bodily from the grave. And when, when we celebrate the Easter uh, time and, and the resurrection of Jesus, it gives the assurance that we've been brought near. That uh, our sins that divided us have been taken out of the way. And uh, we are in Christ forever. The second thing is we've been delivered from the fear of death because Jesus triumphed over the grave. That's a wonderful thing. Oh, it's not that uh, we, we, we want to get in line to, to pass from this life. Uh, God has put in us the desire to live, but we got peace about that moment because the tomb is empty. Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Oh, death, where's your victory? And so praise God for the victory in Jesus Christ that we have in the empty tomb. So we need not live in fear. And the third thing, he's given us, the resurrection gives us meaning and purpose for our lives. And so we live each day. Each day could be the day that Jesus comes back because the tomb is empty. Because he's ascended to the right hand of his father, one day we know for sure that he's coming again. Listen, the challenge of the resurrection is to live every day with the awareness that Jesus Christ lives. And the thing about it is he lives, but he also lives in us. He lives in your heart and he lives in my heart. And all of these are great reasons to rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're so glad we're together and we're going to worship. I appreciate uh, the good music and you join in as we sing. Uh, pray for our nation. Pray for uh, those people worldwide who are still here in the States. The, uh, the death count and those who have contracted this virus. Pray for those families. Pray for those families whose lives have been touched by the death of loved ones. That's, that's a difficult thing. Pray for our president who carries a very heavy load guiding our nation. Pray for our national, state, county, and city leaders as well and the difficult decisions that they face. Pray for our families that are affected by no income. In some cases, their income is cut in half. Pray for the doctors, the nurses, the, those who are on the front line. Pray for all of our firemen and our policemen and our military who are also helping with this pandemic and for our safety, and we are thankful for them, and we are pray, praying for them as they do their job. Pray for our men and women. Pray for all of our churches, uh, our pastors and churches uh, across this land, around this world, that are faithful preaching the gospel. And so be in prayer. God's house is a house of prayer. And so because the tomb is empty, with Jesus Christ is ascended on the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for us. We have one request, and we'll go to prayer. Uh, dear friend of this church, Millicent Mandrino, Joe and Millicent, faithful missionaries out of this church for years um, in, Ch in uh, China. Uh, and so Millicent is having uh, heart surgery tomorrow. And uh, we connected with her this week, and she asked, would you have uh, church family, Rogers Baptist Church, uh, pray for me in the morning and yes, they're going, they're going on with her surgery. So, you know, it's uh, needed and something they can't wait on. So I told her that uh, I would mention her name today. And so uh, this is the time we have our opening prayer. And normally we would receive our offering here pretty quick. But uh, 
uh, wherever you are, I pray you're so good. God bless you, Rogers Baptist Church. Uh, we have online giving, and those numbers have gone up, making it easier for you. But don't forget the Lord's house. And you've been so, so good, not just to give, but to help each other. Give of yourself with neighbors and church members who can't get out. And God bless you for that. But we're in his house today, and so let's rejoice and worship him in spirit and in truth and also with our material possessions. All things come and flow from God. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Father, for the joy of being here today. And regardless of what is happening in our world, our, our attention, our focus, and our joy is centered on you. And we rejoice today because Jesus Christ, our Savior, died for our sins, rose again on the third day, and is seated uh, in the heavens, dear Father, interceding for us. And so, Father, may you infuse hope and joy in the heart of every believer today. Thank you, dear Father, for your grace and goodness in our lives. And uh, no matter how things are in our lives, we can always, always count our blessings. So may we be a thankful people today. May the praise uh, of, of our lips and our hearts flow easily uh, to, today. And may we have hearts to rejoice in your gracious and goodness and for the good gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Well, church, would you enjoy hearing some good news? Yesterday, when we sent out our announcements about today's service, we got a reply back from one of the teenagers who has been in connection through some of the outreach of this church. And uh, they said, thank you for your help and support. I need to start going to church in person when things return to normal. I now realize that Jesus is what I need. And uh, I just want to encourage you, church, that just because we cannot do things as normal doesn't mean that the gospel can't go out. I hope that you will look for opportunities in whatever your situation is to be sharing the gospel because people are primed to hear the gospel right now. Today is a perfect day to bring that up as a topic of conversation, to share the gospel, to share the reason of hope that you have. We hope that you have been staying connected with our church. If you're catching this stream, uh, I trust that that's evidence of that. But if you're having difficulty staying connected with our church, whether that's uh, getting the messages that are coming from our office or uh, needing to be able to get a hold of our directory or getting in touch with one of the uh, online groups that are meeting through Zoom, get in contact with us. You can call the church phone number anytime this week, and we would be happy to help you and to resolve any problems that that uh, you're having with getting connected, and uh, we want you to stay connected. We also want to invite you to join us as we continue in our singing this morning, Stronger. There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and Christ is risen. 
promise of the resurrection, Lord, not that it leaves us without the uh, temptation to sin, but Lord, that it leaves sin powerless over us. Lord, we thank you that you have paid for our sin once and for all. Lord, I pray that we would live as free men and not live as those that are in bondage. Lord, we thank you for your death and your resurrection. Lord, we thank you for your endless love, your mercy that's new every morning. In Christ's name we pray. Hide this. 
his precious blood that gave me life in three days he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense so I come to tell shout and to proclaim that he's coming back for you. There is a blood that sights the blind, that heals the sick, the lonely it finds. It has the This precious blood that gave me life, but in three days he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense. So I come to
Thank you, ma'am. Good to see you this morning. Good to hear that great song. Love it. Love it. I just, in my mind, I heard the choir too. Our choir. <laughs> we miss it. Miss, we miss getting together. Our focus, of course, is lights on. Let it in. Live it out. John chapter 1, verse 4. In him, speaking of Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. So, this morning, I want to talk about resurrection light. Resurrection light. You've got your worksheet there that you printed out. Notice I've got focus passages. We're going to begin uh, in Luke 24, 1 through 8. We're going to infuse both Genesis 1 through 3 and John uh, 1 through 7. And then uh, also 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6. These are all great uh, light passages. And this April brings yet another celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the, the spirit of a well-known Christmas song. We need a little resurrection right this very minute for sure. You say, well, why? Well, the resurrection of Jesus is an eruption of light. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus burst with light. Jesus himself is light. Uh, Jesus proclaimed in John, I am the light of the world. And certainly, that includes the resurrection. Well, praise God, light dispels the darkness, even pandemic darkness. I mean, for weeks we have been inundated with a continuous stream of bad news of a global catastrophe. Tens of thousands of people around the world have died as a result of the uh, pandemic. And this, this virus has brought misery. It's brought pain on many more, those who are, have been laid off and uh, those who are homebound. And it's, it's been a very difficult trial for a lot of people. And yet, and yet my mind goes to the words of Peter at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 24 who said that God raised up Jesus uh, ending the pains of death because it was not now think, think, it was not possible for him to be held by it. The chains, the bonds of death could not hold him back. And so today, today we join our voices with Peter and affirm that it isn't possible for anything to keep us from celebrating and rejoicing in the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, once again, the weary world rejoices. Sometimes we forget that we stand on the shoulders of past generations of Christians who have faced every hardship, malady, catastrophe imaginable, and they did so with their faith intact. As a matter of fact, those trials only purified their faith only strengthened their faith. And truly, it was their faith in a risen Christ that shined a light of hope for a better tomorrow, not only here and now, but an eternal day in an age to come. The light of the resurrection shines throughout the pages of world history. Letters written by eyewitnesses speak of an Easter truce on the Eastern Front in 1916. We've heard a lot about the uh, influenza, uh, the great influenza of 1918 as America was gearing up and going to war. But in 1916, that war was being fought on the Eastern Front. Frederick Kahn was serving as a medical officer with a Hungarian regiment in Galicia, where Russians and Austro-Hungarian forces were facing each other in entrenched conditions entirely similar to the Western Front. And that war was fought in the trenches, so to speak. And so Kahn recalled the events of Easter Day. Now think about this in 1916. And he writes, The winter of 1915-16 was very severe. And when I joined my regiment at the end of February, the country was covered deep in snow. 
No military action was possible. However, when the thaw set in and the peace stopped, artillery duels began between the Austrian and the Russian forces and armies started again, sometimes by day, but more often at night in the darkness. And then he says, suddenly on Easter Sunday at five o'clock in the morning, about 20 Russians came out of their trenches, waving white flags, carrying no weapons, but instead baskets and bottles. One of them came quite near to one of our soldiers. And, and so our soldiers went out to meet him and asked what he wanted. He asked whether we could not agree to stop the war for a day or two because, after all, it was Easter. He says, we can meet between the lines and we can have a meal together. We told him that first we'd have to ask our military authorities whether such a meeting would be possible. The division commander refused permission. <laughs> Nevertheless, at 12 noon, the Russians came out of their trenches and brought with them their military band who came playing full strength. And they brought baskets of food and drink. And we came out too and had a meal with them. We also brought food and drink to offer them. During the meeting, both sides seemed to be a little embarrassed. But both sides were polite to each other and consumed the food and drinks we offered each other. So after, after a few hours, we all quietly went back to our trenches. Then he said this. I have seen demonstrated in front of my own eyes that suddenly people who were trying to kill each other and will try to kill again when the day was over were able to sit together and to talk with each other. Whether it's a virus killing people or a military action killing people, peace is always possible with Jesus Christ. And that is the power of resurrection light. Luke, in his gospel account of the resurrection, begins to talk about the darkness of the early morning. Notice Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. These women, namely Mary and Mary Magdalene, were moving toward the tomb where Jesus' body was hastily laid late Friday afternoon. It was Sunday. It was the first day of the week. For the Jews, it was the day after the Sabbath. This was considered the third day since the resurrection and burial on the previous Friday noon had taken place. Luke makes it clear that the women began their track to the garden tomb very early in the morning. And they came with fragrant sp spices, especially that are used for embalming the dead. And I'm thinking of, of Mary as she anointed Jesus with that, those spices on the eve of Passion Week, in, in lieu of his burial, this very moment. And they brought those spices. They arrived early to provide whatever additional care they could provide for the body of Jesus. Verse 2, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Well, that was strange. I mean, something wasn't right. The stone covering the mouth of the tomb, we know, was large and it was sealed, by the way, and guarded by Roman soldiers. Why would the tomb be open? How was the stone rolled away under such circumstances? What has happened here, they thought. 
Verse 3, and they entered in. Wow. They entered in that tomb and they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. An already dark morning suddenly grew darker. They entered the tomb. They, they couldn't find Jesus' body. It was nowhere to be seen. Verse 4, And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. That word perplexed, of course, means confused. It means anxious. It be very concerned that the, the darkness of sorrow and grief of losing Jesus is now compounded by the emotions of fear and despair. And yet, something even more profound had happened. The darkness of the tomb was pierced suddenly by radiant light. Two men stood beside Mary and Mary Magdalene. These heavenly messengers were clothed in brilliant light and as they were, it illuminated the sepulcher. It's interesting that Greek word translated shining in our text speaks of a flashing light like a bolt of lightning. That happened just not very long ago as we were out in the, the churchyard and the storms were making themselves known. A similar Greek word is, is used to describe Jesus' clothing at his transfiguration. In Luke 9, 29, Luke tells us that, that Jesus took Peter, James, and John to a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion or appearance of his countenance, his face was changed. And it says that his raiment, his clothes became white and glistening. The angels and their garments were shining, you see, with Shekinah glory of God, just like the transfigured Jesus. Now think about that special morning. Verse 5 begins, And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth. Now we just see in our minds. Think about that. In that tomb, Mary... And Mary Magdalene, startled, terrified, and they could do nothing in the presence of this radiant glory but to fall on their faces in utter reverence to the brightness and the majesty of these celestial guests. Verse 5 continues, They, the angels said unto them, Oh, I love this. Why seek ye the living among the dead? What a, what a question. Now, almost a rebuke. The angels asked the disciples, Why would you be looking for a living person in a tomb? Well, that's a really good question. And sometimes we visit the cemetery. We see the graves. They visit the graves of our loved ones our departed friends and family. However, when we visit people who are alive, we don't go to the cemetery. We go to their homes. We, we go to the nearest coffee shop. Well, Mary and Mary Magdalene were in fact in a tomb looking for a dead man. With a measure of irony, these heavenly messengers say, a grave is no place to find the living Christ. Now think about that. A grave is no place to find the living Christ. And then the two radiant, angelic messengers make this announcement in verse 6a. He is not here. He is risen. And it's hard to imagine how these dedicated followers of Jesus, who were still overwhelmed and grieved by his crucifixion, processed these words that they were hearing. Their heavy hearts were exposed to suddenly, not just to a burst of light that, they, that, that just all but blinded them, but now 
It was a burst of brilliant and unbelievable good news. That Greek word translated risen means to cause to return to life. And surely these faithful women realized that this news was too unbelievable to be true. And yet they thought it must be true. Coming from angels. But how can this be? The radiant heavenly messengers continue in Luke 6, B through 7. They said, remember how he spake unto you. He's talking to these two ladies. How he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. The angels recite to these faithful, faithful women Jesus' own words, prophetic words spoken earlier to his disciples. By the way, which predicted everything, everything that was taking place and had taken place. And the angels speak as if these women these women had previously heard these words personally themselves. Now think about it. Jesus was always teaching his disciples, his apostles, right? They had recently been in Caesarea Philippi, and he said this very thing up there. It says he took the twelve with him. And even though Jesus had communicated and taught this message to the twelve apostles privately, Jesus let me know, let you know this. These women... By the way, during his Galilean ministry, had traveled with Jesus. And they were there. And they heard. And they received <laughs> his teaching. Just as much as these apostles. We, we know by the testimony of these angels that the very least, they heard Jesus teaching from the apostles themselves. And the angels look at Mary and Mary Magdalene and said, you heard him, didn't you? You heard what he said. Verse 8. Notice what it says. I love it. And they remembered his words. They remembered these words. These women not only remembered Jesus' teaching regarding the resurrection. Oh, my goodness. They had embraced it. They had embraced it by faith. And suddenly, resurrection light began to flood their minds and their hearts, turning their sorrow into joy. And perhaps this is the reason John's gospel account of life, of the life of Jesus, opens with this burst of light in the beginning was the Word, the eternal Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Word, the Logos, was with God. And the Word, the Logos, was God. The same, look at this, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, without Him not. Anything made that was made. So before the universe, as we know it now, existed, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, dwelt together in holiness and light of holiness and fellowship and unity. I mean, these angels, they are angels of the presence, you see. No wonder they radiate the light of God. And together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. In John chapter, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, we're told that the earth was without form and void. We're told that darkness, look at this, covered the face of the deep. And yet, and yet, there the Holy Spirit of God hovering, brooding, some translate, over the waters, the face of the waters. And even in that darkness. I want you to know that God had a plan. 
God had an eternal purpose. Just yesterday, April the 11th, 2020, Queen Elizabeth said these words. She said, we know that the coronavirus will not overcome us, she said. As dark as death can be, light and life are greater. That's what she said. I'm amazed. It was so. It was so in the empty tomb. It was so in the beginning of creation. We must never forget. Now listen to me. In this dark hour, we must never forget that God's servant, sovereign purpose is alive and active in the good times, yes, but also in the bad times. You know, I say especially in the bad times, in the light and in the darkness. And then in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, God seizes the moment and he speaks those wonderful words. <laughs> Let there be light. What happens? God illuminates the darkness as he begins to bring order to the chaos. The earth was to become habitable as God's eternal redeeming purpose was going to be accomplished here. Of all the billions of galaxies, of all the countless planets in the universe, it amazes me that God chose this little green orb called Earth, planet Earth, to display His redemptive purpose, His grace, and His love. God's eternal, eternal purpose and I say it often, is to procure to himself a people who will love him by choice because love must make a choice. John, the beloved apostle, lets us know that God's pronouncement of light is consistent with his divine immortal character. Notice in 1 John 1, 5, John, who also writes the gospel, writes in his letter, this then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you, <laughs> that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Someone has said the most precious light is the one that visits you in your darkest hour. Are you looking for God's redeeming light in your dark and difficult trial today? God's light visited Hagar in the desert. God's light visited the Hebrew children there in that fiery furnace. God's light visited the lion's den as, as Daniel was cast there. Listen, God's light visited the two Marys and they were in that dark tomb of a cemetery. And God's light can visit you today. Sad to say the record of Genesis 3 goes on to tell us that the darkness returned. Satan entered the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent. He dangled the carrot of self-determination and self-will and selfish ambition of having God-like prerogatives. Adam and Eve then plunged humanity into the depths of spiritual darkness, alienating them from God's light. And although they were created in God's own image, Adam willfully, listen, he willfully chose the depths of darkness and sin and disobedience over a light, a life of light and love and submission to the Creator. And sad to say, people are still making that choice today. Paul in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us that sin entered the world of humanity through one man and death through sin like a pandemic. Death spread to all men. 
because all have sinned. But hallelujah, God didn't leave us in the darkness of our sin. Can I hear an amen? Yes, the earth was without form and void. But, but God had just begun. He didn't leave this earth in darkness. He didn't leave the tomb in darkness, you see. And even though Adam and Eve hid, as it were, with guilt and shame from God, yet God cried out. And God, like light, reached out with His reconciling grace. Man doesn't seek God. God seeks man. Genesis 3.15 of that great, great chapter, we've recorded the first expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Speaking to the serpent, he said, And I put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It'll bruise thy head, but thou shalt bruise his heel. I just want you to know that God... From our perspective, God is saying to humanity, you may have fallen by the seed of the serpent into the darkness of sin. But though the seed of, but through the seed of woman, I am going to send the light of my Redeemer. The light. When my Redeemer comes, He'll crush the serpent's head. Oh, it'll cost him. The Redeemer's head won't be crushed, but the serpent will strike his heel. And for a moment, it'll seem that Satan, the serpent, and his seed has extinguished the light of redemption. But no. On the third day, on the third day, the light of the risen Savior will shine. Mary and Mary Magdalene know it is so. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, John the beloved apostle writes in John 1, 4, and it's right up here on our wall, in him was, speaking of Jesus, in him was life. And the life was the light of men more than physical light. Jesus' spiritual light is powerful today. I just want you to know that. Powerful to pierce the darkness of sin, the darkness of unbelief. You may think you're a hard case. You say, Pastor, you don't know the choices I've made. And like Adam and others, willfully I've chosen darkness over light time and time again. And I've pushed away God I pushed away God. I want you to know that this, this Easter Sunday morning serves to remind you that God's light shines. God's light can pierce the darkness of your heart and your unbelief. Hey, listen, if it, if it pierced the heart of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus and transformed him into the apostle of Jesus Christ, it can conquer your darkness. It's here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, that we connect the dots. I mean, the let there be light in Genesis 1. The radiance of the empty tomb there in Luke 24. And Paul, his own personal testimony of a gospel light, the light of the risen Savior, the good news of the gospel that pierced his heart. And basically here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul shares his testimony. And notice, in terms of light, look in verse 4. Paul writes, In whom the God of this world, or Satan's seed, the serpent's seed, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord. And ourselves? Nah, your servants for Jesus' sake. Well, 
fault? Why? How did this happen? And in verse 6, his own personal testimony. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Now look at this. Hath shined in our hearts. Just like it pierced the darkness of the waters and the deep in Genesis 1. Just like it pierced the tomb of Jesus. It pierces and shines in the hearts, the dark hearts and the heart of Saul of Tarsus. Notice he says, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. How amazing that as the enemy of Jesus Christ, Saul of Tarsus was transformed by the light of the gospel. Listen, the same light and life of Jesus Christ can still transform a light, a life of chaos into one of order. A life of dead religion into a living relationship with God. A life motivated by selfish ambition into a selfless life. Serving all humanity. That's amazing. It's amazing. In the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 6 and 7. John, the beloved apostle, speaks of John the Baptist who came bearing witness, telling the truth concerning Jesus Christ. And while John the Baptist wasn't that light, he pointed others to Jesus who was the true light so that everyone would believe on him. On the cross, Jesus' substitutionary death satisfied both God's justice and his divine wrath as he bore my sins and your sins upon the cross. Jesus' resurrection proves that the darkness of sin and death and the grave had been defeated. Hallelujah. At some point in time, before Mary and Mary Magdalene visited the tomb, on Sunday morning, God's voice was heard in that dark, lifeless tomb, saying, let there be light. And when Jesus exited the grave that resurrection morning, I mean, I don't know. We were talking about Lazarus, you know, as some weeks earlier as Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. I don't know if he came walking out, hopping out, floating out. I don't know. He said, unbind him. I want, you know, Jesus made his exit out of his tomb in a glorified, resurrected body. Isn't that amazing? Lazarus had to die again, but not Jesus. He did so with a new, glorified, resurrected body. Jesus arose literally a new creation. That, that very night in the upper room to his disciples, he appears to those who for fear had locked themselves in and all others out. And although Jesus' new body uh, w w was just out of the grave. It was not like the other. I mean, he suddenly appears in their midst. No one opened the door for him. No one unlocked the door. He just was suddenly there in their midst in a new body that could pass through any physical barrier. This was Jesus' body. And it is today, except for one thing. It still has the marks, the piercings of his hands, his side, and his feet. <laughs> and in that new resurrected, new creation body of Jesus, he said, hey guys, it's me. It's me. Peace be unto you. It's me. Go ahead. Put your fingers in my side. Touch my hands and my feet. He was the same Savior 
today by the redeeming power of his resurrection, I want you to know that Jesus still brings about a new creation in, your, in our hearts. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. To be in Christ means to have accepted Jesus' sacrifice as the Lamb of God, as payment for our own sin. The Bible says that in our natural sinful condition, we're the enemies of God. Alienated, you see, by our sin. We cannot do anything to cleanse ourselves. However, when, humble, when we humble ourselves before God, when we accept His sacrifice on our behalf, He switches accounts with us. Our sin for His righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, perhaps one of my favorite Verses in the Bible. And I've got a lot of favorite verses. I love it where Paul says, For, for he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who never sinned. He knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. With a new creation comes a new resurrection perspective, an outlook on life. In the mid-1950s, a British minister named W.E. Sangster began to lose his voice, began to lose his mobility. He had recognized that the end was near. He had a progressive muscular anthropy situation in his body and every day he was losing his ability to move and so he said Lord if this is it I'm going to just start writing and I'm going to start praying and suffering W.E. Sangster pleaded one day, let me stay in the struggle, O Lord. I don't mind it if I can no longer be a general. Just give me a regiment to lead. Let me just, as long as I have breath, let me make my life count. Wow, what a, what a powerful thing of the resurrection, the new creation in the heart of his children. Sangster's voice eventually failed completely. His legs became useless. And on Easter Sunday morning, just a few weeks before his death, he took a pen and shakily wrote his daughter a letter. And in that letter he wrote, it is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice with which to shout, He is risen. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout those words. How does this Resurrection Sunday find you this morning? Is there a desire in your soul to shout, Jesus is risen. There's a poem written by Annabel Shilston Thomas entitled Resurrection Light. It expresses it's the power of the resurrection this way. Resurrection Light. Risen Christ, when darkness overwhelms us, may your dawn beacon. When fear paralyzes us, may your touch release us. When grief torments us, may your peace enfold us. When memories haunt us, may your presence heal us. When apathy stagnates us, may your anger, when anger ignite us, 
but when your memories, when your justice fails us, may your anger ignite us. When apathy stagnates us, may your challenge renew us. When courage leaves us, may your spirit inspire us. When despair grips us, may your hope restore us. And when death threatens us, may your light lead us. Amen. Resurrection light will bring you hope, will bring you joy, and will bring you peace as you wrap yourself in Jesus' light. This morning, I would ask you, where you sit, wherever you are, are you in the darkness of sin and rebellion against God? Have you realized that you're alienated by unbelief and sin? I want you to know this morning, this Easter Sunday morning, that Jesus came to die for you, to give his life, an atonement, a sacrifice for your sin. And from the cross, he cried, it's finished, paid in full. I want you to know that that atonement can cover your sin. As you trust, you give your heart to him. On the third day, Jesus rose again so that our lives can have a new Creation. You see, when you trust Christ, you see differently, you hear differently, you, you have different values and thoughts. Your, your life turns from the darkness to the light of His righteousness. And I pray that if you have not received what Christ has to offer, there's not a better time than on a resurrection Sunday morning to give your heart to Jesus Christ. He'll change you when you invite him into your heart. The, the light that would pierce, as it were, the, the darkness of the tomb of your heart and life. Like Paul in the face of Jesus Christ. He'll change you from the inside out. Let's pray. So Father, I pray as we conclude this service. There's one who, within my voice, hears these words, the message of the gospel. And by your Spirit, you quicken them, their minds, their hearts, to hear and see and believe. To trust in you, I pray that right now, they'll say yes. I believe that Christ came and died for me. And that he was buried. And that he rose again for me. And I want his resurrection light to pierce my heart and my soul. Father, I know that by your spirit, you're still in the act of recreating and creating hearts and lives to serve you. I pray that this morning that will happen. Lord, may your children this day rejoice. May we walk in your light and you may attest, be a testimony through us of what you can do in every heart. Thank you. We praise you, Jesus, our risen Savior. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.